It's so easy as a disciple of Jesus to condemn those around us that are having God move, but they're not a part of us. Those people? You revealed yourself to those people? It's like, guys, open your eyes. This morning is Pentecost Sunday. I do want to recognize that out here in the beginning. I'm going in a different direction a little bit, but it is Pentecost-centered about the Spirit coming and dwelling with us. But I'm also revisiting a topic that somebody recently talked about. Pastor Decker gave a sermon on this character, and I'm sitting back in my seat writing, (laughs) usually, and and typing questions in my my notes. And that's where we're ending up this this morning. I was thinking of a couple different topics, but I ended up back here. This story is an amazing, amazing story, and it's a story about where is your bucket, It's a great biblical story. We all know it well. (laughs) So let's stand. I do want to read this. You'll recognize it immediately. It's out of John chapter 4, if you want to turn to it. John chapter 4. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees, the Parashim, had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the fountain. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? And Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have no bucket to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands, and the man you are now with is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir or Lord, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming, and has now come, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is Spirit, and His worshipers must worship in the Spirit and in truth. The woman replied, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with the woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then, leaving her water bucket, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way towards him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him some food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, 
And we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. Father God, thank you so much for this story of this woman and how this interaction occurs. Help us to associate ourselves or step into the stories and, and try to understand it so we can live it out and understand that you truly are to be worshipped in spirit and truth. In Messiah's name, amen. You may be seated. Now, this morning, I'm not going to give a big, long thing on geography. I'm not going to try to go into history of Samaritans, where, the, where Samaria is. That's not where I'm going to go. Pastor Decker did an amazing job. Go back and listen to his sermon. I did, just so I make sure I didn't say something that was duplicating. But he does a great job of explaining the story. I want to focus on something else. I want to focus on the dialogue of the conversation. This story is one of the deepest dialogues that we have between Christ and a person. It is filled with meanings, textual references. He's pulling things, she's pulling things, and this dialogue is not just a simple man talking to a woman. There are three major dialogues in this story. The first one is between Jesus and the woman. And throughout it, you're going to see water being mentioned. Actually, it says fountains, buckets, and mountains. The second one is the woman in the village. Come and see a man. And the third one is the disciples and Jesus. Why don't you want our food? So he is masterfully, and John does this, is masterfully layering this story with intense amount of meanings. You have to realize that John is doing a bunch of things in his book. He's talking about miracles and activities. He's talking to the Jews and he's talking to the Gentiles. He's going back and forth and is layering upon layers all these meanings. And the first thing that I want to do as a believer and a studier of the text is ask the question, why? Why is that in the text? Over and over, Christ does certain things. We have to ask why. One of it is, why does he always show up to the women? It's a valid question. Mary first understands that the Messiah is going to come through her. The first woman that hears that Christ is the Messiah, the first person, is not just a woman, it's a Samaritan woman. Who stands at the foot of the cross? The women. Where are the guys? Who first shows up at the tomb and realizes that Christ is not there? You want to talk about somebody that's coming to do something that's different. This Messiah guy is doing things, bringing people in, looking for the marginalized, looking for those that have been pushed aside and saying, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. I have come to seek and to save everyone. This story is also about identity, of recognizing where your true identity comes from. Is it going to be based on certain activities? Is it going to be based on your bloodline? Are you a Jew? Are you a male? Are you a female? The identity is all-encompassing in this, in this character of the story, not only in the image of Christ and the Messiah, but also this woman. And this identity gets summed up into different activities. It's saying something. There is this image that is happening all throughout this and the identity being placed. So we see in this story that it says that it is about noontime. You ask the question, why? Now, we've heard many stories about her being an outcast, now having to show up at the well at 12 o'clock in the afternoon. It's the hottest part of the day. That may... I may be the right way to do it, but what does the text tell us about noontime? Noon is always this moment of revelation. It's the brightest out. Things are revealed at noontime. And there's something about having to walk through town in the bright noonday sun carrying your bucket. What's everybody else doing at noontime? They're sitting on their porch, eating their Subway sandwich, and you have to walk by. It's like you showed up an hour from, late from work. It's not five minutes, it's an hour, and everybody just goes, whoop, 
What are they doing? <laughs> and you mean the question, why is, why is she doing that? She didn't blend in with the crowd. She, she's out there now having to walk through town carrying her whatever kind of bucket it was. Mine's from Rural King, and that's pretty much my life anyway. And, but she now has to carry this, and, and the whole town knows her business. It doesn't matter why she's there, but they do understand that, that what is happening, and you have to have a water bucket. Three things in life you need, air, food, water. If you have those three, you're okay. In that day, water is extremely important. They didn't have pipes. They had to go get it. We also see that this is outside of town. It's about a half mile away. It's not right inside town. We don't know why the town didn't go near the well. There is a lot behind this I don't go into. There may have been another well in town. We don't know. But it's not an easy walk. Isaiah 58 says, And you draw out your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul. Then your light shall rise in darkness and your obscurity be as the noonday. In the noonday sun, you can't be obscure. It's impossible. We grope for the wall like the blind, Isaiah says. Yes, we grope as those who have no eyes. We stumble at noonday as in the twilight. You will make your righteousness in psalms. Go forth as a light and your justice as the noonday sun. Evening, morning, and at noon I will cry out in distress. You will hear my voice. Over and over this noonday is this moment of revelation. Things get revealed at noon. But she summoned all of her strength, grabs her bucket, through town she goes, out to the well. I like to think that she is singing a song. Maybe it's a song, I'm Still Standing. After all this time, looking like a true survivor. <laughs> I don't think they had Elton John back then. But maybe that's what she's doing. How old is she? Is she a young teenager? If you had five husbands and living with a six, is she an older woman? A long past? But here she comes, carrying the bucket. And she looks off in the distance and, and she sees the well, but something, something's different today. There's somebody there. And you recognize the outfit. It's, it's not Samaritan. That, that's got to be a Jew. There is a Jewish man alone at the well. Who keeps walking? What type of person continues to walk to the well. I came up with two, may or not be the only options. First one's broken. Doesn't matter anyway. What's he going to do? What's another man going to do to me? The second one is powerful. If he learns who I am, if he knows what I've done, if I can show him my credentials, then I'm okay. I can't go into the second part of that story. The Midrash does. Look up just the concept of a priestess at the temple of Zeus or a priestess at the temple and marriages. Ask me afterwards. <laughs> But this is dangerous for either scenario. We have a Samaritan woman, Jewish man. Just as a really quick snippet, when the Maccabees came into power, they wanted to destroy the high places. And they looked at the high places of Mount Gerizim, this temple that now had to Zeus and where the tabernacle was, and they went in and wiped it out, destroyed it. Samaritans were absolutely irate. They slaughtered the priests and some of this. 100 years before, 100, 100 BC. Finally, at about 6 AD, the Samaritans got together on Passover and snuck into the temple and threw human bones into the temple. Nothing more desecrating of the, the holy place than throwing human bones into it. 
they are at heads. Pilate is so upset about this. Yes, the same Pontius Pilate goes to Mount Gerizim and slaughters the Samaritans. This is not an easy conversation that is getting ready to happen. But she keeps walking. Now, so it started in the beginning of the story about Christ walking into it. And John is very specific. In the Greek, it says that he sits and comes to a fountain. Why is it called, excuse me, a fountain? And Jesus, tired as he was, sits down at the fountain. And she says, the whole dialogue begins to happen. Will you give me a drink? You're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan, the whole dialogue. And she asks, why don't you have a bucket? I love that. It's practical. It's also deep. Where's your bucket? Valid thing to say if you're coming up to a well without a bucket, why are you there? Now, this is very specific. It gives us where he's at, the plot of ground, where he's at, Jacob's well, fountain. It's exact. It's very specific. Of all the stories in the Bible that I could take you to to stand exactly where Jesus was and sit down exactly where he sat, this is the only place I can do it in Israel. I can take you to a vicinity. I can take you within 50 square meters. But the exact point, this is about as precise as John can get. I can give you the GPS coordinates, but you just don't understand that anyway. So here it is, exactly. Plot of ground, Jacob's fountain, Christ sat down beside the fountain. Now, what do we have to ask? Why is John being so precise about the location? Why isn't it, hey, outside of town there's a well, that's where Christ met her? No, 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 no. Something is being set up here that is extremely important. Why is it saying that it is a fountain, and why is it Jacob's fountain? 1 Corinthians 4 brings up a concept that is laced through the text. Listen to this. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, and they all passed through the sea. They were baptized into Moses in the cloud of the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. Listen. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. It's one of the craziest questions to ask. How in the world did this rock follow the children of Israel in the desert? The text says, there go the children of Israel, and right behind them is hopping along a rock. (laughs) I don't know if it hopped, I don't know if it walked, not sure. But there's a rock that follows them, and that rock is in picture Christ, and out of this rock flows living water directly from God. I know, you're looking at me going, what in the world is this text saying? Remember, pictures. It's trying to show us something that's happening here. This idea of a rock that followed him is is all throughout the Old Testament text. We even see it in the Midrash. We even see it in the historical documents. Philo, first century historian, talks about it um, by saying that uh, 40 years did he rain bread from heaven for them and brought them quails from the sea and a well of water following them. I know. Midrash, think of Midrash as a Jewish story about their heritage. That's really what it is. They didn't have text at that point, so they're just telling stories. It's it's Uncle Joe did this, Grandpa Steve did that, and it's just passed down generation to generation. And a lot of this is is talking about it. Akiba talks about it, that says that everywhere their forefathers went, they, they dug a well and water just sprung forth. Abraham digs a well, springs forth. Jacob digs a well, water comes out. Isaac redigs the well, water just comes gushing out. Over and over and over again, the forefathers dig wells and water just comes out of everywhere. It's in the backside of the desert, it's on the coastal plain, it's in Shechem, it's in the north. Everywhere they dig, water just gushes out. In the Midrash, they say that that is the same source. Makes sense. Everywhere they dig, water comes out. They also then tie this into transporting this well. And Jacob does this. It says that Jacob was 70 years old when he went forth from his father's house and the well went before him. Because everywhere he went, water came gushing forth. And it even says that he leaves the well behind at Bethel. This well is tied to the same water source of the children of Israel. It worked for the patriarchs. God gave them the promise. They show up in the desert, water comes forth, this rock follows them. That's the image. I'm not saying scientifically there's a rock 
But that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying in picture, this is what the text is trying to tell us. It overflows. John is writing about the seven miracles. This is one of the miracles that is happening. Jacob has five miracles. This is the fourth miracle that happens, the gushing water. He's tying this story together. In the Exodus story, we have this this song that's recorded that Miriam sings. It's right after they get the well, strikes the rock, water comes gushing forth. Listen to her song. Then Israel sang this song, Spring up, O well. Sing about it, about the well that the princes dug, their forefathers, that the nobles of the people sang, the nobles with scepters and staffs. Then they went from the wilderness to Matana, which means gift, from Matana to Nahalia, from Nahalia to Barnath, from Barnath to the valley in Moab. And everywhere they went, this well was with them. Bear with me. This is tied, this well that Abraham dug, the children of Israel, the water out of the rock, is tied to Jacob's well. Anytime you read Jacob's well, you need to imagine water gushing forth, fountain springing out with living water from God, because God promised it. So, where is Jesus sitting? Beside the well which springs forth living water directly from God. Springs forth. He doesn't need a bucket. All right. So, why does Christ then say, will you give me a drink? Why doesn't he say, can I borrow your bucket? Better question. I'm a guy. She's just walked from a half mile from town carrying these things. Can I borrow your bucket? Or can I help you? Why does he say, will you give me a drink? Why those words? Where in the story does that happen already? Abraham sends his servant north to find a wife for his son. He sits beside the well and says, if there's a girl that comes and gives me a drink, that's the one. What does he ask her? Single woman walking in. Will you give me a drink? Wells are where you go to find a husband. We see in the text. We see it with Isaac and Rebekah. We see it with Jacob and Rachel. We see it with Moses and Zipporah. Anytime you see a single woman walking to a well, she is going to find a husband. I need to find... Sandy, you need to find a well. (laughs) (laughs) Now, it it plays a very interesting aspect of our story about husbands. There is also then, the woman responds very specifically then by saying, are you greater than our father Jacob? How does she know this story? She is already seeing the Jewish man, knowing where he's at, what this source is, hears him quote a line out of a movie, okay, almost, and he immediately jumps and says, wait a minute here, your father, that I'm going to tie this to Jacob. He just quoted the story. We, don't, we often underestimate these characters in the story. This is why, going back to her being maybe a different powerful figure, she knows the text almost better than anybody that interacts with Christ that, I've, that you come across, because she immediately puts this together and goes, wait a minute here, are you saying that you are greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself as did his sons and his livestock, immediately tying the story together. There's one more that I need to tie in here. When Jacob continues his journey, goes north and, and meets with the people in the plains, he comes to a well, but there's a, a stone over the mouth of the well. This happens a lot because you need to keep animals out of the well. It's also very sandy, wind's blowing. You just don't want stuff falling in your well, so you cover it with a big rock. Some of them are round, some of them are like a plug, big old heavy things. You can actually see there's big old logs here to help leverage this thing out of the way. But he gets to the well, and it says, when all the flocks were gathered there, the shepherds would roll the stone away from the well's mouth and water the sheep. This is out of Genesis 29. 
Then they would return the stone to its place over the mouth of the well. Now Jacob asked the shepherds, my brothers, where are you from? Haran, they replied. He said, do you know Laban, Nahor's grandson? Yes, we know him. Then Jacob asked, is he well? Yes, he is. And here comes his daughter, Rachel, with the sheep. I love this part. Look, he said, the sun is still high. Whoa. Whoa. It is not time for the flocks to be gathered. Water the sheep and take them back to pasture. He's like, okay, guys, woman coming. It's about noon. Why don't you guys just, just, just disappear for a little bit? <laughs> I see a woman. I want to be alone here with her. We can't, they replied, until all the flocks are gathered and the stone has been rolled away from the mouth of the well. Then we will water the sheep. While he was still talking with him, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherd. When Jacob saw Rachel, daughter of his uncle Laban, Laban's sheep, he went over and rolled the stone away from the mouth of the well and watered his uncle's sheep. Then, then Jacob kissed Rachel, and she began to weep aloud. I would love to have been there. He had told Rachel that he was a relative of her father and a son of Rebekah, so she ran and told her father. All right, Jacob's at a well. Rolling the stone away to reveal living water? I mean, come on. All right, there's a gift. He waters a sheep to a woman at noon, living water, running, telling. Within a few moments, this Samaritan woman picks up on the story and goes, wait a minute here, are you better than Jacob? One, it's a little selfish of a request, are you going to fill my jugs up with water here? But where's your bucket? If you are, my job just got a lot easier because I don't have to put down my bucket 100, I think it's 28 feet down Jacob's well. It's a very, very deep well. It's going to overflow. So John does this very quickly, ties everything together. It's a fountain, source of living water. Jesus there, single woman, coming to a well, going to find a husband. The gift of living water, overflowing fountain. But did you catch where Jesus is sitting? Near the well. Now the text doesn't say this, but is he sitting on the rolled away stone? That's called foreshadowing. Now, it's one thing for us to put this story together so quickly because we have it in our Bibles, but she is doing this in a conversation. The Samaritan Bible is the Torah only. That's all they had. Obviously, because of separation, they didn't have the prophets, they didn't have the writings, just the Torah. Today, the best preserved Torah is the Samaritan Bible. We still use it as a source. She immediately puts this together. But she realizes Christ doesn't have a bucket. But she knows the story and wondering if he's going to do a miracle. Now, Christ responds and says, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I'll give them will never thirst. And she's replying, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty. And he replies, Go and tell. Go and call your husband and come back. Christ's encounters always take a turn when you don't expect it. A twist of a saying, a pointed comment, she was right in line with him, bantering back and forth. Oh, we're talking about this story? Okay, I got this response. Back and forth. This is about Jacob. This is about the well, the fountain. Where's his bucket? It's just firing all cylinders. And he says, oh, I'll tell you. Just go call your husband first. Every conversation that you have that brings up Christ is going to get a point that's uncomfortable. You have to. It always has to get to the heart of the matter. And there, once again, she realized she's still standing outside in the hot day sun, still carrying her bucket, still has a problem with husband. Now, Christ reveals out the truth. You've had five husbands. You're living with a new man. But you say the truth. Now, step into the story yourself. 
If you were standing there, what would you tell that woman? Adulterer! Put a red letter on her. Don't you know the Bible says? Oh. Because Christ didn't come into the world to, to condemn the world. He came into the world to save it. Because it's easy for us to condemn it. The Bible does say. Jewish law does say. It says if you had three husbands, you can't get married again. It doesn't matter for what reason. Death, it doesn't matter. Only three. I want to ask the question, who can get a divorce? Can a woman get a divorce? Why do we always assume the worst with women? Oh, it's her fault. She, she's got to be a prostitute. She's got to be the worst of the worst. Five husbands, come on, woman, get it together. Can a woman get a divorce? No. A man gives divorce to a woman. And this is a big debate. They're asking Christ this a lot. It's like, what about divorce? Are we allowed to? Are we not allowed to? Hillel says we can give it for any good reason. Literally, if she messes up supper, divorce. And she might go, like, well, maybe not quite that much. It's got to be a serious mess up. It's a seri- they're debating this a lot. She may have been there for no fault of her own. Death. If, if you are barren as a woman, it's cause for divorce. Does she have any say on that? No. But here she is. But Christ reveals everything. And in her bucket is filled with shame, chaos, misunderstanding, and it may have not all been her fault. But we got to realize that I've got a bucket too. I have to carry my bucket around. And in my bucket, there are things that I have tried to, to dip the bucket into to, to get water, to, to, to make sure I stay alive. And I find it that it's, I pursue things that aren't of God. I don't dip it into the things that are living water. I pursue things of my own, things like, like, like titles. Oh, have you seen that one? It's the third Sunday. Uh If I'd be accepted, oh, if I can just do that, then they'll accept me better. I hate failure. Oh, never let you see me. Fail. No way. My entire life, my value, I carry in my bucket. But the problem is, if I do that, I can't, it doesn't hold living water. I, I, I can't use this to, to get filled with what Christ is trying to give me. Because my value's in this, and I, I, I've had to carry it. I've had to, to, to lug this around my entire life. My, this is who I am. I've got to walk through town in the bright sun showing people this is, this is what I am. We often try to hide it. We turn it around. We sneak out the backside of town. But Christ doesn't need a bucket. He offers so much more than what we carry in ours. He says, out of you shall flow streams of living water. Why is it a fountain and not a well? Because it gushes forth. In an instant, the story changes. Everything that the woman had tried in the past is now gone. Five husbands. Like all encounters with Christ, theology gets in the way. She hears the story. She knows what's happening, but there's a problem. If she has to go do sacrifice, which she has to do to get forgiven, where do I go do it? Valid question. Do I go to Mount Gerizim? 
Do I got to go to Jerusalem? Do I do the Roman road or the sinner's prayer? Do I go to the altar or can I pray at my seat? Do I pray and have to immediately get baptized or can it be a week later? Can it be a month later? Do I have to get baptized? Valid questions. But Christ realizes that the heart is more important than the theology. He has an answer. Oh, by the way, it's Jerusalem. He kind of does. He's like, wait a minute here. It doesn't matter the location. How would you have responded? Well, if you confess and believe, if you do this and this, it's doctrinally sound but relationally wrong. Because the time is coming, he says, when we worship in spirit and in truth. And the woman's like, yeah, I know the Messiah is going to come and she's going to exp- he's going to explain everything to us. W- wait, that much faith? He's going to show up and it's all going to be solved. And he just responds like, I'm he. And she's like, don't need that anymore. Leaves her water bucket behind and goes and tell. When you meet Jesus, the real living water, there's only one response. You leave the bucket behind. He gives living water. The past is forgotten. The shame is removed. The disgrace is gone in an instant. You push the bucket aside because now you're in new life. You are now the bride of Christ. She finally found the person she had been looking for. Conversation number two is what she has with the village. She comes running into town. You can't make this stuff up. And declares, come and see a man. Is there one conversation that this woman would avoid like the plague? I found another man. Come on, guys. I found it. They're like, is this the seventh one? Really? Really? Until our mess becomes our message, has Christ filled us with living water? She doesn't care now about the past. I found the man. I found that he's told me everything that I am. They're like, well, we gotta go, we gotta go see this. Is it out of intrigue? Is it out of a bit of humor? It's midday. Let's go find this. We gotta, gotta see what's happening here. They come to him and begin to talk to him. And I love this. We don't believe now because she just said she found him. We believe because we found it. And they believed. And for two days, at the beginning of Christ's ministry, he tells them. Now, every story, there's two sides. Prodigal son, one son separated from the father because he sold everything. The elder son separate because he just doesn't want to agree with what the Father is doing. In this story, we see the disciples and the woman in our third, a third dialogue. His disciples go into town to get food. Don't underestimate how difficult that would be for a Jewish group to go into a Samaritan town to buy food. It's walk into an Egyptian bazaar and try to haggle with somebody. $10, $10, $10, $10. No, it's 20 for you. It's going to be 20 for you. <laughs> and they come walking out of town, thankful that they were able to stay ritually pure, They hand the stuff off, left it on a table. They didn't have to touch anything. And they see the Messiah talking to somebody. And he's talking to a woman. And she's Samaritan. In broad daylight. Now, if you're a disciple of a rabbi, first thing going through your mind is like, nobody better see what he's just doing. If the parashim see what he's doing right now, it's going to get really ugly. They could drag him before the Sanhedrin, throw him into jail. This is a serious offense. 
Protect the rabbi at all costs. Women, I don't care. Samaritan, absolutely not. Protect the rabbi. He has to remain pure. But, I love it, they want to say something, but they says that they don't say. <laughs> I love that. They're thinking it, but no, 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 no. They say, no, remember what we're supposed to be doing? We were supposed to go get the food. Rabbi, eat something. And he responds and says, but I have food that you know nothing about. What? Do you realize what we just had to go do? We were doing what you wanted. We had to go get food for you. We had to go into that Samaritan village over there, and that's a sinful village. We almost got impure because of that. Do you realize how hard it was for us to get the right food? They didn't want to sell it to us. And you got food. You ordered DoorDash. <laughs> Delivery? Really? And he's like, wait a minute. No, no, no. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying it's still four months into harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. It's so easy as a disciple of Jesus to condemn those around us that are having God move, but they're not a part of us. Those people? You revealed yourself to those people? It's like, guys, open your eyes. The field is ripe unto harvest. I'm not just come to the Jews. I didn't come just for the men. All are equal. All have, can be saved. Closing thought. This is me just thinking. What happened to this woman? I think, number one, she was no longer referred to as the man with five husbands. I think she now is the one who brought us the Messiah. She showed us the Messiah. But did she become a follower of Jesus? Did she follow him on the, on the journey? Did she walk with him to Jerusalem? Was she there at the crucifixion? Did she stand with the other strong women that saw Christ crucified? Maybe she was there when the noon happened and darkness descended and she remembered how it was a dark noonday. Did she remember at the well when Christ gave her living water and she left her past, her bucket there. And she wept. And the spear pierced his side and out flowed from him water. We have to realize that this bucket of ours has to be left at the foot of the cross. has to be there where we accept the springs of living water. It's not in who we are. It's not in what we've done. All we have to do is say, this man is the Messiah. And then our message becomes, come and see the man. The one who's not here to condemn, but is here to seek and to save that which is lost. You can leave your bucket behind. Leave it at his feet and bathe in the springs of living water. Shall we stand?